Hi everybody, welcome to COM 170. My name is Evan Jones and I'll be acting as your instructor for this session. I'll properly introduce myself in a second, but first I want to do a quick overview of today's lecture slash lesson. I should note this one is a little longer than our typical lecture, but there's a lot of house cleaning and setup work to do here, and it's better to do it all at the beginning of the semester. So here's the overview for today's class. Again, I'm going to do a quick self-introduction here in a second, then a thorough syllabus review before we look over the three readings we've assigned for today and a bunch of definitions and terms. Additionally, at three points in this lecture, I will intercut discussion questions that you will put up on the discussion boards. The video lectures will be available for the length of the course as well. You should note, however, that if a word appears on screen, that you should make an effort to capture it and to put it in your notes. Vocabulary will be very important in this class. As we work through today's readings, we're going to get an overview of rhetoric and some key terms and try to contextualize them. Teaching this class is really exciting, but also a tad bit intimidating because rhetoric is a heavily debated term with a complex history. It means something different to different audiences, and there's a million different definitions of it. How many of us know the term rhetoric from being used as a kind of insult, for example? As in, that's just empty rhetoric, or that's just meaningless rhetoric. Well, it turns out that a lot of people through time have had that idea and made that argument, including Plato. His student, a guy named Aristotle, definitely disagreed, and rhetoric is nothing if not filled with disagreements. However, by the end of this course, you should have an understanding of several models, versions, and flavors of rhetoric, as well as some more comprehension on why it's such an exciting yet challenging topic. So as far as my self-introduction goes, my name is Evan Jones, and I'm a third-year PhD student here at Chapel Hill. I went to Ryerson University for my degree in film and the University of Southern California for my master's in communication management. My background is predominantly related to film and media, but my studies here are centered on space and place with a specific focus on abandoned structures. Part of why I chose to attend UNC was specifically to look at materiality in rhetoric. And in fact, one of today's readings from Places of Public Memory helped convince me to attend school here. I want to get into a really thorough review of the syllabus with the caveat that the syllabus is an important document and a vital document. I recommend everybody read through the syllabus all the way, take notes if need be, and get an idea of what the course will be like, what timelines will look like, and what readings will be used, etc, etc. While crafting it, I tried my absolute best not to create questions in your head and to clarify as much as possible beforehand. But if you should have any outstanding questions, please reach out to me. That's really important. You should feel free to do it. I welcome conversation. Please reach out. I figured this is a good time to put my email address on the screen, which is patlabor at unc.edu. And let's move on to the syllabus review. All right, so a few seconds ago, I said you need to read the syllabus. And let me go ahead and reiterate that. You need to read the syllabus. The first class of every course always features a dive into the syllabus. And sometimes this feels redundant, but it's important information. And moreover, it's important information you're going to come back to again and again. So I want to do a read-through summary from page 2 to page 5, then we'll get into the meat of today's lesson. So regarding texts, there are no textbooks required for this course. All reading assignments will be posted to the Sakai site under Resources. An important note on reading that I need to share with you is that the readings for this course are challenging. Some deal with complex philosophical and theoretical concepts, while others require quite a bit of historical or cultural context. In either case, you should plan to set aside at least one hour each day to complete the assigned reading. Completing the reading does not necessarily require you to fully comprehend it. We're going to play with ideas in this class, and that's part of the charm. It means you should walk away from a reading session with some guesses, some questions, some critiques, all of which I expect you to take up in our discussions, and which you will engage with via your posts. To be blunt, you are going to be in trouble if you do not do the reading for this class before lectures are posted. Do the readings and watch the lectures. And remember, you can go back to things. That's heavily encouraged. With regard to online teaching flow, aka how this class will work, I want to be clear, I do not consider remote instruction as a less serious version of in-person instruction. In reality, it is often more demanding because it requires more effort by more people. And with that in mind, we may make adjustments to this plan and to the syllabus as we progress so as to meet the aims and goals of the course with more efficiency. Please consider a syllabus as a living document, which is subject to change, and please do reach out to me with any questions or concerns. COM 170 is asynchronous, meaning this will not be a everybody on Zoom at X time for a group lecture class. On class days, I will post either a video or audio lecture online, possibly both, which builds on the reading for that assigned day. For this reason, I heavily suggest you do the readings before the lecture is posted. I will be online via Zoom for office hours every day right after the lecture is made available, 
so you can ask any questions there, and that information is posted up on the Sakai site now. And you can also contact me to set up alternative venues for inquiries should you need to. By 11 a.m. the next day, I will expect you to have responded to the three discussion questions I will insert into the digital lecture at random times. You will answer these in your online forum posts. I will post a separate document with stipulations for posts, and if you find yourself writing more than, like, say, 400 words, you're moving into essay territory, so you can use that energy later. And I will expect proper sentence structure, grammar, and clarity. Perhaps most importantly, be sure and directly answer the question. Needless to say, you're going to want to watch the video and listen to the lecture, etc, etc. There will be information in these lectures which clarifies and expands upon the ideas you see listed in the syllabus, and it may well be integrated into course assignments or exams. Additionally, every week, students will need to come to office hours via Zoom at least once. These check-ins can be done in groups and should not require more than 10 to 15 minutes, but giving you the opportunity to discuss and interact with the readings, lectures, lingering questions, and your fellow class members is important. Moreover, this allows you to engage with the ideas and use me as a resource. For those of you unable to attend due to whatever reasons, because life happens, we can make other arrangements, but it is your responsibility to contact me about this and work out those arrangements. Question 1. What's the difference between ethos and pathos? During the course, you will submit three short reflection slash analysis essays, three to five pages apiece, APA citation format, at predetermined times. See below in the course calendar for due dates. Course Policies Our goal is to facilitate a positive, supportive, and interactive learning environment, because a large portion of our course time is dedicated to analyzing public and or political discourse. It is critical we practice the values of respect, openness, and reflexivity. It is also important to recognize that, as engaged members of the public, we are likely to encounter arguments we might disagree with. While challenging, it is critical that we learn how to engage with these topics thoughtfully as participants in a democratic process that relies upon critical discourse. Likewise, as persuasive speakers, we must ensure our arguments account for our ethical engagement with our audience. That's all really a big way of saying, be cool to one another and relax and take it easy. Accessibility. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill facilitates the implementation of reasonable accommodations, including resources and services, for students with disabilities, chronic medical conditions, a temporary disability, or pregnancy complications resulting in difficulty accessing learning opportunities. All accommodations are coordinated through the Accessibility Resources and Service Office. Please visit their website, accessibility.unc.edu, call 919-962-8300, or email accessibility at unc.edu. Participation. It is vital everyone work together to prepare for, attend, and engage with class every day. This is even more important in an online environment. I understand this schedule is rigorous, and that there are many factors at work here, some of which are beyond your control. That said, you should be prepared for class every day to discuss the assigned readings, be it via video conference or via discussion post. Remember, those discussion posts are a large part of your grade. As university students, you're expected to keep a record of due dates for all assignments and exams. When absences are necessary, again, things come up, I ask that you inform me beforehand out of courtesy and to make arrangements for any affected assignments. Please plan accordingly. Tell me what's happening, and do not leave these things unaddressed until the last second. Office hours and appointments. I'm happy to meet with you to discuss anything related to this course. My regular office hours are listed at the top of this syllabus. Should those hours present a conflict for you, I'm also happy to make an appointment at a mutually convenient time. If you do make an appointment with me, please keep it or let me know as early as possible if you will not be able to make it. Regarding email, email is usually the best way to reach me, although I do have a ham radio license. Please allow a 24 to 48 hour response time. I will often respond much faster, but you should expect at least 24 to 48 hours for the sake of courtesy. I cannot guarantee I will respond to emails on short notice, and especially before an assignment's due. Academic Integrity The University of North Carolina Chapel Hill has had a student-led honor system for over 100 years. Academic integrity is at the heart of the Carolina system, and we are all responsible for upholding the ideals of honor and integrity. The student-led honor system is responsible for adjudicating any suspected violations of the honor code, and all suspected instances of academic dishonesty will be reported to the honor system. Information is outlined in the Instrument of Student Judicial Governments. Complete observation of the honor code is expected. Full acknowledgement must be made when you quote, paraphrase, or use the work of others. It is illegal, unprofessional, and unethical to represent the labor of others as your own. It is illegal because such work is copyrighted. 
It is unprofessional because your reader should easily be able to find your sources by tracking your citations. It is unethical because it is exploitative of someone else's work and because it misrepresents it as your own. Whenever you're quoting, summarizing, or paraphrasing from any source, you are responsible for making sure you have cited it properly. If you have any concerns about academic integrity, please contact me or the Office of Student Conduct. You should also be aware that UNC has a great writing center available, and you can find them online, although I should note that the writing center does not proofread work. Alright, so let's begin our dive into rhetoric with the definition of the term itself. And again, you're going to find competing definitions of the term, but this is a great one to start with, coming to us by way of Aristotle, one of the great philosophers, and perhaps one of the biggest trolls, according to some contemporary theorists, of ancient Greece. You'll find that Aristotle's ideas hang over a lot of rhetoric, like a giant tree providing shade over a parking lot. In fact, today we'll be discussing several key concepts which we can trace back to Aristotle, including a characterization of three types of rhetoric, as well as Aristotle's three proofs. Aristotle's definition was as follows. Let rhetoric be defined as an ability, in each particular case, to see the available means of persuasion. This is the function of no other art, for each of the others is instructive and persuasive about its own subject. And that comes to us from Aristotle's On Rhetoric from about the late 4th century BC, and this was translated by George A. Kennedy in 1991. You're going to find people reference this definition over and over. However, not only is it not the only definition, it's also one people get wrong a lot. They'll just say, rhetoric is the available means of persuasion. Indeed, it sort of instructs you to not be that reductive. Aristotle's definition qualifies rhetoric with the, quote, let it be part. It worked for the Beatles, too and talks about how it should be an ability used in particular cases. Now, if I really want to complicate this, I can point you to other translations of the definition, since Aristotle was speaking ancient Greek after all, which says it's a survey of the available means of persuasion. So already we're coming into some tension some disagreement with regards to parsing the term, coming from two scholars, Kennedy and Lundberg respectively, who both happen to work at the same school, which just happens to be UNC. Another UNC faculty member, our own Carol Blair, in the comm department, was one of three authors who wrote the book Places of Public Memory, and she offers us another definition of rhetoric too. We'll talk more about Dr. Blair specifically when we discuss materiality and space and place in rhetoric, but we assign this reading for a couple of reasons. One of them is because Blair, Ott, and Dickinson take how memory works with regard to rhetoric and how it interacts with place as well into account. This is why they open with the story of Simonides, where he remembers the location of the people crushed during the banquet. The authors feel memory has been ignored lately in rhetorical studies. Quote, The argument of this collection, however, is that within the contemporary moment, rhetoric, memory, and place form complex and important relationships. For Blair, Dickinson, and Ott, public memory places are rhetorically important. This argument requires a definition of rhetoric that differs from Aristotle's. Quote, Rhetoric is the study of discourses, events, objects, and practices that attends to their character as meaningful, legible, partisan, and consequential. But what most clearly distinguishes rhetoric from other critical protocols, cultural studies or literary criticism for example, is that it organizes itself around the relationships of discourses, events, objects, and practices to ideas about what it means to be public. See how that differs from Aristotle? They then go on to state that, quote, We take rhetoric to be a set of theoretical stances and critical tactics that offer ways of understanding, evaluating, and intervening in a broad range of human activities. They discuss meaning and legibility. They also note, quote, Rhetorical legibility is predicted in publicly recognizable symbolic activity in context. That is, rhetoric typically understands discourses, events, objects, and practices as timely, of the moment, specific, and addressed to, or constitutive of, particular audiences in particular circumstances. According to Blair Ott and Dickinson, rhetoric can also be partial. Rhetoric has understood, in most of its Western renditions, that discourses, events, objects, and practices have attitude. Quote, Rhetoric takes discourses, events, objects, and practices to be activities of a partisan character, embracing some notions and despising others, willfully or not. Discourses, events, objects, and practices are, for rhetoric, consequential, and they can be public as well. So in short, according to Blair Ott and Dickinson in this reading, you have a far more thorough version of the rhetorical model, one speaking to meaningfulness, legibility, partisanship, consequentiality, and publicity as manifested in discourses, events, objects, and practices. Now, we can see the variability of the idea of rhetoric at work, because we just skipped a gap of thousands of years from Aristotle to Blair Ott and Dickinson but we're still calling up the same schemes, forms, and concepts, the same topoi, as it was called, that Aristotle did to inform arguments. 
And so, since we're back to Aristotle, let's stay there for a bit and talk about three forms of rhetoric he describes in his text on rhetoric. Forensic, deliberative, and epideictic. So, if you take one thing away from this class, it may be this. Rhetoricians love words, as you could probably tell. We've got a lot of ground to cover in that sense today because we're going to talk about three types of rhetoric as well as four special rhetorical terms which rhetoricians use to make arguments. In On Rhetoric, Aristotle describes three types of rhetorical species. Forensic, also called judicial, deliberative, and epideictic. For Aristotle, these are really important means of persuasion, and we use the terms today to try and locate where and how arguments appeal to us. The first is forensic or judicial rhetoric, used to accuse or defend, which typically applies to discussions of the past. Perhaps legal discourse is the most readily available example. You can remember this one by thinking about making an argument in court. And indeed, when we talk about Athens and ancient Greece, oddly enough in the future, we'll see how important that was, defending yourself as a citizen. The second is deliberative or legislative rhetoric. This differs from judicial rhetoric because it's about the impact of future actions, which is why you'd see it argued, say, in a legislative context, in Congress or the like. You'd look at using this to urge on action, you should vote for this because X, or you should vote for this because Y, or you should vote against this because Z. The third is epideictic rhetoric, which is ceremonial, celebratory, or otherwise demonstrative. To be honest, you can tell I'm all about convincing you how rhetoric is this wonderful set of tools, so in my own low-key, low-voiced way, I'm performing an act of epideictic rhetoric right now. However, keep in mind, I could also use epideictic rhetoric to blame or praise, but the big thing to remember here is that epideictic rhetoric is of the present, used in the present moment. However, here's the fun part. When you hear something praised or blamed, you might also use that information in the future. You often do, right? So there's an overlap there. These things are not as rigid as they may seem. Question 2. What was Aristotle's definition of rhetoric? So, quick related note before we move on. One thing to keep in mind here is that each of these had special topics related to what we now call invention which actually came about later as a term, and which we'll discuss in a bit. Invention is essentially the processes of discovery for finding resources and arguments, which can be employed for when they're about to be put into use, or for when you're playing an argument. The special topics for judicial rhetoric were justice, injustice, for deliberative, good, unworthy, advantageous, disadvantageous, and for epideictic, they were virtue and or vice. These three species of rhetoric could be used in an argument via the means of persuasion, which Aristotle called proofs, like in math. These are logos, ethos, and pathos. We'll discuss these now to finish our lesson, along with a word about kairos, which is another really useful term. All right, so Aristotle believed the purpose, or telos, of human conduct was to achieve happiness. The point of deliberation is to arrive at krisis, public judgment, and these are all Greek words, by the way, about how to achieve public happiness under specific conditions. These conditions can be complex, so finding basic routes is important. In addition to the species of rhetoric he identified, Aristotle had three proofs he used as means of persuasion. Ethos, pathos, and logos. Now, we use these means of persuasion and identify them all the time, but often in a way where we may not necessarily think about their point of origin, nor their original meanings, which have changed as time passes and become more simple or sort of different and distorted. So it's easier for us to start from the beginning than to go back and reconstruct things, but rest assured you're familiar with these effects, if not necessarily their point of origin. For instance, oh, what a pathetic story, or she has a good character, I can tell by the way she speaks, or the logic of these ideas really appealed to me, and when they explained them and showed the evidence, it all made sense. I can see why I would vote yes for this, no doubt. Those are examples of the three proofs at work. Ethos. So while we shouldn't say that ethos equals character, like an equation, ethos is not a thing or a quality. According to Aristotle, and I'm paraphrasing, ethos is concerned with going beyond the past. It is concerned with the interaction of a character formed through the patterns of interaction that occur in the actual rhetorical event. In On Rhetoric, Book 1, Chapter 2, Aristotle says, quote, Persuasion is achieved by the speaker's personal character when the speech is so spoken as to make us think him credible and should be achieved by what the speaker says, not by what people think of his character before he begins to speak. Remember that, his character may also be called the most effective means of persuasion he possesses. Now obviously, let's all note the gendered language there, because that's ancient Greece, but this applies to everybody today. To be clear, ethos is not reputation. Ethos is dynamic and is developed in our talk, while we speak, not prior to it. 
It is what Aristotle calls an internal or artistic means of persuasion. So what are we looking for when we listen to somebody speak? A lot of the time we're looking for good character. Making a good impression in terms of ethos involves convincing an audience that you possess positive mental or moral habits, like intelligence or integrity. Ethos is a quote, caused response. That is, the interpretation is based on what and how a rhetor speaks. Aspects are his or her message from which audiences form an impression of the rhetor's character. Questions of ethos are likely about audience assessments. What conclusions might they legitimately draw about the rhetor's character based on the speech? What issues did the rhetor address or not address, and how? What might this tell us about the rhetor's character, intellect, or goodwill? Now, let's also discuss what ethos is not. Ethos is not a direct appeal, but an audience evaluation. Although ethos is often translated roughly as ethical appeal, that can be misleading. Ethos focuses on perceptions of the speaker resulting from interactions with the audience. Meaning again, we judge ethos by way of how the speaker is speaking as they speak. But also, ethos is not a set of traits or qualities possessed by a rhetor. A rhetorical analysis of ethos focuses on ethos as a judgment, quote, caused by the speech itself. Pathos. Pathos is the audience's emotional state induced by the rhetor's words, arguments, and so forth. Pathos is, importantly, not the emotion displayed by the speaker. Pathos works as an invitation to the audience whose emotional character is made manifest in a response. There's a paradox at work when you look at pathos, though. There's a distinction to be made between reason and emotion, which can also be seen as a distinction between being rational and irrational in terms of speech. It's not uncommon that people who get upset, angry, flustered, or bothered in the public sphere of communication may be interpreted or portrayed as unstable or screwed up. Like when you hear somebody say, I couldn't listen to that person speak, they were hysterical, or oh, stop being so dramatic. But at the same time, pathos works as an invitation to the audience whose emotional character is made manifest in a response. Think about playing on people's anger, or working on establishing a friendly feeling which the speaker could claim would benefit an audience. Isn't this a great class? You're all going to be so much better for taking rhetoric in COM 170. Pathos. There you go. Question 3. Name an example of an epideictic speech from film, TV, movies, or your life in general. Why was it epideictic? What does epideictic speech do? The last of the three proofs is Logos. And of Aristotle's proofs, Logos is the only one considered to be a direct appeal, meaning ethos and pathos are indirect appeals. Logos is about the content of the speech, the words, and the logical structure. Logos is the human capacity to reason with others about what is good or bad, harmful or helpful, and so forth. Now, here's something very important to remember. Logos is not logic. There's a relationship there, but saying Logos equals logic is overly simplistic and just outright wrong. Logos points towards a speaker's reasoning with the audience, the argument and evidence offered. The argumentative forms may overlap with logic, but Logos is not synonymous with logic as a term. For Aristotle, Logos is, quote, the speech itself that proves or seems to prove. For Isocrates, Aristotle's senior, who we'll cover later, and that's not Socrates, that's somebody else, Logos was essential in creating a mindful and capable polis, or public. It is incredibly useful for inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. So let me describe induction and deduction before we talk about Kairos. Induction is reasoning that moves from specific cases to make general claims rhetorically known as argument from example or argument from paradigm. Deduction, however, moves from general claims to make arguments about specific cases. Deduction is rhetorically related to the enthymeme, and we're going to spend a lot of time discussing enthymemes in the future. So this all brings us to our final term, kairos. Kairos deals with the right time or opportunity to deploy an argument, and deciding when is the optimal time to deploy that argument. It involves questions of tone, wording, approach, etc. as well. We're discussing old Greek thinkers right now, so it's a good time for me to tell you about, say, how the Sophists were a group of people who Socrates openly disliked. But if I mentioned how Aristotle was a troll, well, I did earlier, and start talking about message boards in the middle of class with no prompting whatsoever, then perhaps that's not the best way to approach an argument. As an audience, you may not be interested in that aside. So if I did so, I would have messed up my Kairos game. All of this, of course, is dependent upon the audience, another huge consideration factor for Aristotle and rhetoricians before and after him. Thank you all for being such a good one today. I'll be online for office hours at the usual times. And again, if you should have any questions or needs, please email me at patlabor at unc.edu. Be sure and get your discussion posts up by 11 a.m. tomorrow. Take care. See you soon.